Hey, guys. Groovy ride. Want a lift? Hey! Okay, dude. Let's see what that jalopy can do. What's a jalopy? <laughs> First off the line. Yeah. I'm sure they're feeling pretty silly right now. Here I go, I'm about to freak the flow. About the Cartoon Network. And things they show. We got the super adventures, tune heads, and late night. It's black and white, but everything's alright. But I'll break it down a little bit more. Tell you what they have in store. What is tunes you're looking for? We got Fred Stone and Body Rubble. My man. What have you done to my robot? My robot. Mine. So, I'm kind of tired of thinking. Not like about important things like the environment or Nisi Nash, but like about my entertainment. It's getting too smart. Everywhere I look, it's allegory this and metaphor that. And yeah, it's cool that the stuff we watch teaches us good morals and social problems and all that stuff, but like, I kinda just wanna watch cool stuff happen. I wanna turn off my brain, eat some food that could probably kill me, and bear witness to some of the raddest stuff ever made by human hands. And for that, I can think of no better show than Magus XLR. Huh? Your mom's so gonna kill you. Megas XLR might be one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of stuff. I've even seen you. But don't turn around, keep watching the video. It is the most unapologetically indulgent thing that Cartoon Network has ever made. And it wears everything it loves on its sleeve. Pro wrestling, tokusatsu, video games, anime, Garuga Mask, and most importantly, giant robots. Lots and lots of giant robots. All of this and more is soaked in the early 2000s, deep fried in pizza grease, and served up hot. And it is glorious. But like most good things, it wasn't made to last. Magus was a star that shined too bright, and before we knew it, it had burnt out. But man, what a ride. So join me as I tackle what made this show Cartoon Network's raddest failure, and why it failing didn't actually have to happen. Yeah, I bet that got your attention. I'm your host, an unknowable cosmic whore, D'Angelo Edwards, and today, I am taking my hat off to Megas XLR. Oh man, you got a wicked slice. The sun was in my eyes. Yeah, right. So, what is Megas XLR, and how did it start? Before we get to learn about that, we have to take a quick detour down the mean streets of MTV, and it's there that you'll find the little show called Downtown. Man, you've got absolutely nothing to worry about, man. You got me, you got all the kids, we're gonna help your ass out, man. So you're paying me, right? Downtown was a cool little show that specialized in creating a vibe, full of that awesome early 2000s urban culture. It gained quite a nice little cult following and even won an Emmy, but it was also an animated MTV show, so... Sorry, you're cancelled. Yeah, it only got the one season. But this one season was enough to unite Chris Pronoski, the creator of Downtown, with Jody Schaefer and George Christick, who both also worked on the show. And together, the three of them would join forces to make something amazing. They wanted to cram everything awesome into what would be an even more awesome show. In an interview from Comic Art Community, Schaefer said, Basically, we knew we wanted to portray everything we got a kick out of, and looked for ways to incorporate it. We had all the usual influences, giant mecha, pro wrestling, cars. We loved them all and wanted to see them all mashed into one show. Have you ever heard a more beautiful quote? If more people thought this way, we'd live in a perfect world instead of... Well, this one. So, the boys got to work, with Christic writing, Chris directing, and Schaefer leading art direction. Using their own resources, they cobbled together a pitch, 
which they then handed in VHS form to the then Cartoon Network executive Linda Siminski in the middle of Comic-Con. Okay, so pro tip, don't do this. This will not work. And the only reason they probably weren't blacklisted was because A, they already had the experience of working on downtown, and B, Siminski was already acquainted with Schaefer as she had been his professor in college. Again, this won't work for you, especially nowadays. But both her and Cartoon Network thought it was good enough to get a pilot, and so enlisting the help of famed anime studio Madhouse, the short pilot Lowbrow would be created, and would premiere at Cartoon Cartoon Summerfest, which, similar to The Big Pick, was an event where Cartoon Network showed off several pilots with the hopes of turning one or more of them into a full series. R.I.P. in peace, Kitty Bobo. The world was not ready for you. Also, R.I.P. the bag boy. The world was ready, we just didn't want you. But Lowbrow was a clear hit, blowing away every other pilot that premiered in the event, which Cartoon Network might not have been too happy about. They did a bunch of pilots and put them in a And they lost with Blu-ray I mean, can you blame him? This boy looked expensive. And after a two year wait, Lowbrow would premiere as a full series, now titled Megat's XLR. So, what is Megat's XLR all about? Well, to be honest, the pilot pretty much explained it all. A car and video game obsessed man-child finds and repairs a giant robot. And while cruising in it with his best friend, they discover that it's actually a secret weapon sent from the future, meant to be used to save the world. And now, its former pilot wants it back. One problem though, the robot has now been so thoroughly customized that its former pilot can no longer control it. So it's up to her to train these two idiots to save the world and to help her get back to the future. And the main series basically starts off from there too. Although of course everything is far better explained since they got bumped up from 7 minutes to 22. The series stars Coop, the big eating, game beating, brand new pilot of Megas, now called Megas XLR or Extra Large Robot. Jamie, Coop's awful, awful, awful best friend Jamie, who by the way is awful, and Kiva, the pilot from the future who is now unfortunately stuck with these morons. The show follows their adventures as Coop learns the pilot Megas to help defeat the Glorf, the alien menace that destroyed Kiva's future. But mostly it's just him goofing off, watching TV, playing games, eating food, and causing general mayhem to the greater New Jersey area. I want to cruise around in this baby, smash stuff. Maybe pick up some chicks. Chicks dig giant robots. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Good thing no one important lives in New Jersey. Where do you expect them to go now? I don't know. Philly? Well, good thing no one important lives in Philly. All throughout their adventures, you'll see the gang take on robots, aliens, living planets, cyberworms, and more as Coop and the bad guys compete to see who can cause the most damage. No, seriously, most of the devastation that happens in this show is Coop's fault. What a fowler! He might always stop the bad guy, but at what cause? Now, what makes this show work for me are a few key aspects, and I want to start off with the first one, because that's how numbers work. Let's talk about the characters. This has to be one of my favorite group of characters in any cartoon. And yes, regardless of how awful he is, that does include Jamie. But before we get to him, we gotta start with the big guy himself, Harold Kuplowski, or mostly known as Coop. Coop is a bro. He is a bro in every sense of the word. He loves nothing more in this world than working on cars, slamming down junk food, and making every video game kneel before him. He's basically a walking, talking stereotype for every overgrown gamer out there, but Coop is actually likable because he's so genuine. 
He knows what he likes, and he's gonna live it up until the day he dies. Pure hedonism. That's something I can get behind. He doesn't care if you think the stuff he likes is lame or if you call him fat. In fact, he considers it a compliment. We'll take care of this chubby thief and get your robot back. Chubby? Lady, this is fat. This definitely could have aged pretty poorly nowadays, and while the show does make a few fat jokes, they're never really laughing at Coop, they're mostly laughing with him. Coop is pretty much content with who he is, and because he doesn't sweat the small stuff, he can get right to the important stuff, smashing bad guys. And he's pretty good at it too. All those years of gaming and partying have pretty much made him the ultimate combat master. He's like Kirito if you actually wanted to be his friend. Hey guys, D'Angelo here. I just wanted to come out and say, no, I don't hate Sword Art Online. I like it quite a bit. It has pretty sword fights and boobs, and to be honest, that's enough for me. I think it's become too easy a target, and I took that easy shot. And for that, I apologize. Alright, back to the show. So yeah, Coop is great. Super likable, comfortable in his own skin, and willing to lend a helping giant robot hand to anyone who needs it, even if he ends up doing more harm than good in the process. It's the thought that counts, right? Nah, this man's a terrorist. And his best friend Jamie isn't much better. Jamie sucks, man, but I still like him, if that makes any sense. Okay, so put it this way. If Jamie was a real person, we would not be bros. He's cowardly, manipulative, and only out for himself. And normally I'm all for this kind of behavior, but Jamie pushes it a bit too far. He's also kind of a creep, constantly striking out with girls or scheming ways to get with them. Heck, even in the pilot, one of the first things that Jamie fantasizes about doing with Magus is abducting a woman from her apartment. Send him to jail! We gotta get him out of here. But yeah, all this stuff makes him an awful person, but I like watching it. Jamie is terrible, but he's funny. I'm not rooting for the guy, but I definitely wouldn't change him. Not every character has to be a role model. Sometimes it's fine for a character to just be a dick. As long as it's never grating. Like yeah, most of the time Jamie sucks, but regardless of how much he tries to use Coop, you can tell that he still cares about him. He likes having fun hanging out with him, and the two share most of the same hobbies. The only problem is that Jamie lets his own insecurities beat him most of the time. He even admits to Kiva once that Coop is his only friend, and without him he'd be sunk. He's always flunking out with women, but if he put down the cool guy act a little, and tried to be a decent guy, he'd probably be locking it down. A lot of girls in the show even find him cute. It's the rest of him that's the problem. But regardless of how messed up he is, he'll still always be there for Coop. And if Coop can stomach him, I think I can too. Coop! That guy's a friend of yours? He's my best friend. And no one treats my buddy that way. Except for me. For a living, deserve more credit and respect! You want us to pick you up something? Yeah, a new time flux unit so I can get out of this Neanderthal nightmare and back to saving humanity's future? Uh, I don't think they got that. You want some beef jerky instead? Sure. Lastly, rounding out the trio, we have Kiva, the warrior pilot from the future. Kiva is a really fun character, and a great foil for the boys. She's the only one of them who's actually serious about saving the world from the Glorf, and because of that, she's usually left frustrated with Coop's, uh... Well, let's say less than redeeming qualities. She's great in the fight, quick to make a plan, and she knows how to make those metal boots work. I actually thought her feet were like fully mechanical at first, but in this episode, you actually get to see her feet, so mystery solved. And no need to thank me, weirdos. Because she comes from a war-torn future, in the beginning of the show, she's extremely focused on her mission, and hates when Coop and Jamie slack off. And she isn't too fond of them anyway. My robot wasn't meant to be a toy for a prehistoric yahoo and his pet monkey thing. Boom. 
roasted. But as the show goes on, she starts to get used to Coop's way of life and is shown having more fun with them, and even develops a sort of fondness for them, as well as slushies. Which quick side tangent here, one of my favorite episodes is called All I Wanted Was a Slushie, and all it does is chronicle Coop's seemingly endless quest to get a slushie, and an alien robot just keeps wrecking every shop, and the show just makes the slushies look so good. Like, I swear, every time I watch this episode, I just want to bolt down to the nearest 7-Eleven and drink my fill. I have never wanted a drink more than the Tri Slurpee Cup they have in this show. Like, how was that not a promotional thing when this came out? I would have ate it up. Or drunk, drunk it up. I, you know what I mean. I need it! But anyway, Kiva is great, and her general responsibility helps to balance out the slacker vibe of Coop and Jamie. But of course, she wouldn't have much of a world with only three characters, so there are a few other key players. Hey, uh, wanna check under my hood? <laughs> of course you have Goat who's actually a character from downtown that made it into Megas as well. Though we had to trade in his cigarette for a lollipop. Real 4Kids vibes here. He's the lazy owner of the junkyard that sold Megas the coop for only $2. Much to his disappointment. What's that? No idea. Two bucks, huh? I'll take it! Oh, man. He's a pretty fun character, too. And most of the time he's on screen, he's either living that sweet junkyard life or striking out with Kiva. If you look at the credits of the show, you'll see that he's actually credited as himself. And that's because he's both voiced by and based on a friend of the creators, Scott Rednicker, whose nickname is Goat. Then you also have the Glorf, the main bad guys of the series. They're this weird half Cthulhu, half Decepticon race of aliens who want nothing more than the destruction of the Earth and the possession of Magus. The main war master of the Glorf kind of has like a Queen Tyranny and Duck Dodgers kind of relationship with Coop. With him mistaking Coop's improvising and sheer luck for skilled military tactics. That is, of course, minus the romance. Unless... HA! GAY! The Glorf are your basic fun bad guys and they get some really funny moments off every now and again. Besides them, you have all your other assorted baddies, your various robots, alien monsters, hot alien bounty hunters, they are just an excuse to have two girls fight. Coop even gains a few allies in his adventures, like the S-Force, a science ninja team gotchamon reference, nice. Check out the bait. Way cooler than the standard Power Rangers joke you would normally get, with some Voltron flair thrown in for flavor. They start off as enemies, with the S-Force coming in to capture Coop for all the destruction he's caused over the galaxy. Which... <coughs> fair. But they end up teaming up to take out their main bad guy, and Coop even teaches them a thing or two about his fighting style. Let's see who can eat the most space burgers? Nice! Yeah, he basically ruins them, but the main recurring character that I want to talk about is Magnanimous. This giant floating head with just the tiniest little legs. Just tiny little legs. He's the owner of the galaxy's largest fighting arena, and he makes Coop fight for him. But that's not the important part. The important part is who they got to voice him. Capacity crowd, billions of credits at stake. Let's see this subspecies put my money where his fat pie hole is. Yep, that is none other than Ashley Williams himself, Bruce Campbell. And the way they got him to voice is hilarious. They couldn't get Bruce's management to accept their request, so Chris went to a screening of Bubba Hotep, Bruce's most fun to say movie. And then, at a Q&A, he begged Bruce to be in their cartoon. And Bruce being interested, if not a little confused, gave him his agent's number. And so... Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Yeah. 
It's pretty cool that they got such a big actor to be in their show, especially at the time. Even his robot is based off of Ash and Elvis Presley, who he plays in Bubba Hotep. And speaking of voice actors, of course we have the amazing Steve Bloom and Wendy Lee as Jamie and Kiva respectively, and we even have Peter Cullen and Frank Welker voicing some Transformers stand-in. Yes, I know, one of them is based off of Mazinger Z, leave your comment, but did you guys know that Coop is voiced by the dad on Wizards of Waverly Place? That is easily the weirdest thing I learned researching this show. But all these things come together to create an awesome atmosphere of violence and chill days after school. In fact, that's the next thing I wanted to talk about with this show. It has one of my favorite vibes of any cartoon. I love all the robot smashing and bad guy punching, but the quiet moments in between are just as good, giving us some time to really soak it in. It perfectly nails that early 2000s feel, from the clothes that the characters wear, to all the old video games, and especially the music. Besides the amazing theme song played by Ragtime Revolutionaries, it has a killer soundtrack, which is really amazing considering that they had literally no money for their soundtrack budget. In case you've been playing this video in the background, and if you are, stop that. This took a long time to edit. You watch it. This show cost an arm and a leg to animate. Do you see how complicated some of these designs are? If I even think about drawing Magus, I want to throw up. And they had to draw it thousands of times an episode. That stuff ain't cheap. <laughs> so they used their soundtrack budget for animation. And how did they get around having no budget for music? Well, they just used music from the library that Cartoon Network already owned. So if you ever hear some music from Magus, somewhere else, now you know the reason why. You can even hear some of the same music in Venture Bros, which I'm sure ran into some of the same fiscal problems as Magus. But to be honest, I wouldn't have it any other way. This soundtrack rocks, and it perfectly captures the spirit of those old MTV days I miss so much. And speaking of MTV... <laughs> Magus was known for having tons of running jokes. From stuff kids hated getting destroyed, to the buttons in Magus changing every time, to some weirdly targeted gags. Like when the nursing home cheers after a Matlock parody is cut short. But I get it, I never miss a chance to put Iowa down, but by far the funniest running joke they keep going is their absolute hatred of MTV, represented by the in-universe Pop TV. Now remember when I mentioned their first show, Downtown? And how it was cancelled after one season? Yeah, they didn't like that, and so every chance they got, they were just blasting it in Magus. It's so petty, and I can only dream to be this petty one day. These guys are my new role models. All of this combined with some shockingly good animation, which they did by hand. No 3D models except for maybe like one or two scenes in the whole show. They made this robot move the old fashioned way, which I will never not be impressed with. And all of the weapons are so creative, and the settings, and the character designs, and aliens. And man, I freaking love this show. And I haven't even gotten to season 2 yet, which we will talk about right after this break. Take hours. Could. Won't. Man, I hate when he does that. All right, so season two. Probably the most interesting thing about Season 2 of Megas XLR is that it was never officially greenlit. While the crew was approved to start writing scripts for a potential Season 2, they misunderstood. Though, let's be honest, they knew exactly what they were doing. And they started designing stuff, storyboarding, just spending all the money. And by the time Cartoon Network realized what they were doing, they had already spent so much money on it that they just said screw it and gave them another season. That's almost as good as the fact that Aqua Teen kept going just because it was so cheap they forgot they were making it. You can actually hear all about it on the 94th episode of the Toonami Faithful Podcast. Outlet that didn't exist 
you know, back when we got years ago. Back when we bullied Cartoon Network yeah. making our cartoons. <laughs> 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 oh wait, wait, they're not really greenlit, don't tell them! Yeah. <laughs> but I sure am grateful that they got a second season, because that's when they started cranking things up. The show got a slightly more streamlined look, most evident in Kiva's face, which went from a more angular design to a more rounded one, which I kinda prefer. Sometimes she looked a little too Peter Chung for my taste. And they cranked up the action even more, going to more planets, fighting new things, and destroying way more private property. The season finale even ends with Coop going to an alternate dimension, where Jamie is leading a resistance to fight an evil version of Coop and Kiva, which leads to one of the fiercest battles in the show. Top shelf stuff, A pluses all around. But after all the hype battles, alien fights, and MTV smackdowns, Magus vanished. So what happened? Why did Magus XLR get cancelled? At first you would think it was because of the series not having a toy license. I mean, that's what happened to Symbionic Titan, another amazing show that was gone too soon. And yeah, the crew did want to make toys. In my opinion, Magus was made to make toys. Are you kidding me? I would have bought 50 of them as a kid. The crew even made their own and filmed a fake commercial for them. With small, jagged, easy to swallow parts, powerful shooting weapons. And real fire firing fire action! <laughs> but it never went anywhere beyond a couple of Jolly Bee cup lids and a Comic Con exclusive statue, which I desperately want. They didn't even get a DVD release, which is criminal. But no, it wasn't about toys. So then I thought maybe it was low ratings. Ratings can make or break a show sometimes, and if Magus was underperforming, then of course it would get the axe. But it wasn't that either. In fact, on his blog, Christic wrote that they were actually breaking ratings records. But nope, the reason Megas XLR was cancelled was a lot shadier. You see, Megas XLR was in direct competition with two other shows, Teen Titans and Ben 10. And because of the three shows tackling basically the same demographic, Cartoon Network decided to sabotage Magus, which skewed a little older. And it's crazy because to me, this always felt like an Adult Swim show trapped in the Cartoon Network body. I mean, they got away with some crazy jokes. His tentacles are so long. <laughs> Meaning that's tentacle porn. Fisherman's Wife and Fisherman's Wife 2, the retentacling. <laughs> and in an interview with the Waffle Press, they said that if Adult Swim had been around at the time, Adult Swim premiered about a year after Magus had already been in production, they would have definitely pitched it to them instead. Us though, because we were a little bit of a deconstruction. Like, literally, um, had the, uh, Adult Swim came out like a year or two after we had been in production, and if it had been, it, if it had been an entity when we were pitching it, we almost—that's almost certainly where we would have gone. But because of this older vibe, Cartoon Network decided it didn't need it and started moving it around in the schedule, causing its ratings to drop, even putting reruns in the dreaded 3:30 a.m. death slot. It was a dirty move then, and it's a dirty move now. And I can't believe that such an epic show went out in such a lame way. And of course, as most people know by now, around 2014, Magus had been reported as being written off as a tax loss. And because of that, it would not be able to come back in any way, shape, or form, at least in America. Look on a mask with my boy. Coop, you're redlining! Eject! No! I ain't leaving Magus! The crew had actually started thinking about making a reboot or a video game series until this happened, which pretty much squashed all hope of that. But in an interview with the Waffle Press, Schaefer had this to say. 
Um, so we know that um, due to Cartoon Network writing it off as a loss, the show, unfortunately, um, it can't be revived as of now. Um, are there any concepts you would have brought to a revival? Um, and what series that got revived? So, like, say, like Samurai Jack, or we actually, we, we talked about that. You can't ever, you can't never say never. We'll we'll see if anything comes because uh, they have been. Mega still airs in in South America and their other markets, and it is still making them money. So it's probably making the the money at this point. Even though like it's all the losses to get it written off onto it, I, I, it's probably pretty close to at least breaking even. Which when that happens, you know, who knows what the future holds. Um, so, maybe there is still a little hope left for a return. We even got a little cameo in OKKO, OK but by now most of the crew has moved on. Schaefer went on to work on shows like Metalocalypse and Moonbeam City, big faves. And as of now, he's at Bento Box working on stuff like Bob's Burgers. And Chris Dick went on to write for Star Wars The Clone Wars, and he even got to help develop the Netflix Transformers shows. And Chris Pronotsky went on to form Titmouse, one of my favorite animation studios, which led to one of my favorite looking shows ever, Motor City, which I'm sure will have a long and prosperous life. Come on, man, I can't have shit in this house! And so ends the tale of Megas XLR. But what would have happened if it had continued? The team actually had a few ideas they wanted to go with. They would have shown how Coop was actually responsible for creating the Glorf after sneezing into a vat of toxic waste, a screw up to the end. And it also would have fleshed out the relationship between Kiva and Jamie, maybe even leading them to a romantic relationship. But at least for now, Magus shall sleep. But its dedicated fans sure won't. All right, you alien chumps, you in my town. And nobody gets to wreck it. Uh, except for me. Come on, you got any more? We need more bad guys to smash. Let me introduce you to... The Double Deuce! You gotta find first gear. Even now, people still want another season. They crave it. They need it. Fan films are being made. The Megas 4K project spent a lot of time up the show to 4K, which man, kudos to them. This show deserves to be in HD, especially since the amount of motion blur in this show can be a little hard to take sometimes, which might be my only real criticism. To this day, Kiva is still getting new Rule 34 drawn of her. Which I only know for research purposes, of course. Magus XLR was a special show. No morals needed. No lessons learned. Just pure and simple chaos. It's a show that lays everything on the table. Nothing to hide. No ulterior motives. The only thing on its mind is what's the next thing it wants to smash. And when you have an idea this awesome and this heavy, you can't just go big. You gotta go extra large. You know you don't have a chance. I don't know nothing. Looks like someone needs to watch a little more pay-per-view wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> 